this we're having a program which is actually finishing uh, this week on particle physics. And we asked uh, one of the participants to give us a colloquium. colloquium. So last week was uh, Germano, and, and this week we had the pleasure of, uh, of uh, having uh, Thomas Flacken uh, to give a talk. So Thomas, let me sure remember everything. Thomas uh, did his PhD at Oxford University. And then he went for a postdoc at the University of Michigan. And after that, uh, Würzburg, yes. Würzburg. And uh, he's now at the Institute of Basic Sciences at the Center for Theoretical Physics of the Universe in Daejeon, Korea. He's an expert in many different areas, uh, extra dimensions, phenomenology of uh, uh, composite Higgs models. So he's, he's really a broad uh, uh, background. And today he's going to talk about uh, how to search for footprints of a composite Higgs boson. Thomas, please. Thank you very much. So first of all, thank, uh, thank you, Rogerio, for having me. And it's a pleasure to be here. This is my first time in uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil, and actually uh, in all of South America. And so far, I enjoy it a lot, although I'm still struggling with the jet lag because Korea is precisely 12 hours off. So um, I'm going to talk about composite Higgs models and uh, different ways to search for it. Um, and to give you an outline, I'll, I'll first give a short motivation. And let me first of all ask, how many of you are in particle physics? OK, how many of you have uh, heard of the Higgs boson? Good, everybody has heard of it, and uh, how many did calculations on it? Okay, then I roughly know. Um, so I'll, I'll give a, a short motivation uh, on the Higgs boson, and then the question, why should one actually want to change anything about the standard model and about the Higgs boson? And uh, one idea, or the idea of composite Higgs models is that the Higgs boson is not really an elementary particle, but some object which is a bound state of something underlying. And uh, I'll first talk about the, um, the minimal composite Higgs model, which has been studied for a long, uh, long while, and then come to uh, underlying models for a composite Higgs. And uh, I'm working on one particular class of models. And uh, the connection I want to establish is the connection on what can those underlying models tell us for particle physics and particle physics searches at LHC or at future colliders, and uh, how can we look for those uh, models which predict the composite Higgs. So starting with the motivation, um, the LHC is running and is doing a tremendously good, good job. What you see here is the standard model on a cup. So um, you have the gauge interactions. You have the, um, the meta content uh, with uh, the interactions via the, uh, via the gauge interactions. And this part has been known already before the LHC with the top quark found at Tavatron. And now down here, you have uh, the Higgs kinetic term, the Higgs potential, and the interactions of the Higgs with the meta fields. Um, and the Higgs has been found at the LHC. Here you have an overview over the, uh, over the particle content. So you have three generations of quarks, which make up the uh, baryons or the baryonic matter. Then here you have uh, three generations of leptons. We have four interactions, uh, the electromagnetic interaction, the weak interaction, the strong interaction, and then uh, the Higgs, and I'll come to its role in a moment. And what you see here, is a summary plot, uh, this is from CMS, where you have the measurements of cross-sections of all sorts of different particles or combinations of particles, and shown here the production cross-section, which reaches over many orders of magnitude and goes down as far as uh, about a femtobahn, and those are measurements. So this is really uh, something which has been uh, measured and determined at the LHC. So this is a tremendous success. Um, let me come to the Higgs multiplet. 
and I'll, I'll try to differentiate uh, between Higgs multiplet and Higgs boson in the talk. Um, so the Higgs multiplet is a uh, set of four particles. It's a uh, complex uh, doublet of the uh, electroweak SU2 uh, in here, and it has several jobs. Uh, one first job is in the standard model, you have the electro, uh, electroweak symmetry, but actually at low energies, only the photon stays massless, so only the uh, electromagnetic interaction survives unbroken. Um, and something needs to, uh, to break this symmetry down to a, a smaller <laughs> symmetry group. And uh, with this breaking, also make the gauge bosons associated to, the, uh, to this group heavy. So you have here uh, three gauge bosons from the SU2, one gauge group, uh, boson from the U1Y. Only one combination of those stays massless, the photon, whilst the other three, the W plus minus and the Z bosons, get mass. And uh, the way this is happening is it's an interplay between those two terms. Uh, you have the Higgs potential, and so the Higgs doesn't uh, if the Higgs doesn't have its minimum at the origin, but it has such a Mexican head shape, i.e. it has a expect, uh, vacuum expectation value away from zero, then this is breaking uh, this symmetry. And if you then go to the kinetic term of the Higgs, this covariant derivative also contains gauge bosons. So when you expand this term out, you get a mass term, uh, i.e. a coupling squared times V squared over four, uh, times the gauge bosons, so this gives mass to the, uh, to the W and the Z bosons. The Higgs also provides masses to the fermions, sorry, and this comes out of this term here where uh, you have the couplings to two fermions, and if this field uh, phi gets a vacuum expectation value, then this is nothing but uh, Yukawa times the vacuum expectation value times a fermion bilinear, so this is a mass term for the fermions. And there is an additional bonus, which is uh, here we have four degrees of freedom, and I wrote it in such, uh, such a way here that you here see the three SU2 generators and three degrees of freedom along those directions, and then you have uh, the vacuum and you have uh, the oscillations around this vacuum, and this corresponds to this direction here. Um, and this is another physical degree of freedom. Those three degrees of freedom are used up in order to give mass to the W and the Z, but this is an additional physical degree of freedom. So this is a particle which you can search for in collider experiments. And by now, already seven years ago, uh, this particle has been found by both collaborations, ATLAS and CMS, uh, and it has been found in a production channel uh, from gluon fusion and then in a decay into two photons. And what you see here is basically the invariant mass spectrum and the number of events. And what the Higgs is, is this little bump here and analogously here in the experiment. Whereas as background, you would uh, expect this dashed line. So this was the discovery of the Higgs boson in 2012 and by now, a lot of data has been taken, and we know much more about uh, the properties of this Higgs. In particular, um, it has been measured in not only the diphoton channel, but also in other decay channels of the photons. And here you have uh, something which is kind of parameterizing this by ATLAS and the analogous values by CMS. So ATLAS is using a parameterization where those values basically give you the uh, the couplings of the Higgs to the Z, the W, uh, the top, and all the other particles. Uh, so if this value is equal to one, then it is precisely the value expected in the standard model. If the value is off a little bit from one, then it would be a deviation from the standard model. And you see that uh, in all of the different measurements of those fits, you have very good agreement with the standard model. Uh, CMS is using a slightly different representation, but basically comes to the same result. So here you have um, fits for the production of the Higgs and for the decay of the Higgs, roughly speaking, but everything is in good agreement with uh, 
uh, the standard model values. One important point to, uh, to notice is that um, all the measurements which have been done are for a Higgs decaying into gauge bosons or into fermions. There is no direct measurement yet uh, which involves two Higgs particles in the interaction. In other words, we don't have any measurements of the Higgs self-coupling, which means that um, if I go back here, we measured all those, uh, or we measured some of those terms, we measured these terms, but of the potential, we know the position of the vacuum, and we know the curvature around the vacuum, but we didn't really measure uh, the full shape of the potential. So this is one point where there could still be um, deviations. Now, okay, so um, those plots are always done by global fits to all the different experimental channels. And uh, in the black, red, and blue lines, you make different assumptions for the fit. Like uh, in the Black lines, yeah, this is not displayed very well. In the black lines, you do a, a hypothesis test against the standard model. In the blue lines, uh, you allow for having other decay, uh, sorry, you allow for having the Higgs decaying into invisible channels. And uh, in the, um, in the blue lines, you allow for the possibility that the Higgs is decaying to something which is not, not missing energy, but which is also not standard model. So uh, therefore you have the most stringent lines for the most stringent assumption, i.e. only standard model, and then you get larger error bars for, um, for relaxing this assumption by allowing also for beyond standard model decays. And here you also have bounds for uh, how large the branching ratio can be into invisible channels, into undetermined channels, i.e. channels which are not missing ET, but also not standard model. And here, what they call BBSM is uh, the maximally allowed branching ratio into uh, something when you allow for both of these sources. Um, this is, in a sense, uh, experimental error bars. So what is done here is you take the measurements of um, all the different Higgs measurements together in all different channels, all different productions, and you then ask what is uh, the value for those effective couplings uh, with an error bar under the assumption that uh, either only the standard model channels are allowed or that there is some, uh, some, there are some other channels allowed. Um, so basically, this gives you more degrees of freedom in your fit to the data. So, but yeah, the uh, the the bars here, those are one and uh, two sigma error bars. Sorry. Uh, you mean this here? Yeah. Uh, no, you shouldn't be worried. Uh, you see here that the error bar is relatively large, and uh, so here, those are different production mechanisms. So the gluon fusion is measured very well, and this is production in WH, uh, so radiating of a Higgs from, uh, or producing those, and this is uh, a very rare process, so this is why the error bar is large and the value CMS extracts from this global fit is a bit high, but within two sigma you, you're still in agreement. Okay, then let me jump to why are we not happy with just the standard model? And uh, one thing which has been driving, I think, model building and theoretical physics for a long while already is the hierarchy problem. And um, in a nutshell, you have the standard model, and the standard model is a renormalizable quantum field theory. So it's completely healthy. But uh, if you do the renormalization of the standard model, you have to calculate all the loop diagrams. And 
There are different formulations of this, so let, let me use one. If you have, beyond the st standard model, any other mass scale in the game, any other particle, which could, for example, give you dark matter, explain uh, neutrino masses, or uh, even tell you something about uh, gravity, gra uh, grand uni unified theories. And if those new particles have any interactions with uh, the Higgs or also with the top, then if you calculate uh, those uh, radiative corrections to uh, the Higgs two-point function, then you find that uh, the change of those is, uh, is some loop vector times the new mass scale at which this physics enters over the vacuum expectation value squared. You can renormalize the theory, but it basically means that at every level you have to tune your parameters uh, by this amount. Now, if you want to, uh, to have the standard model valid up all the way to the, to the Planck scale, then uh, this is 10 to the uh, 17 GeV uh, over uh, about 100 GeV, so this is, a, uh, this is a big tuning. There are many other ways to formu formulate this problem. Um, so the standard model is consistent, but we don't understand from this argument why the electroweak scale is so much lower than uh, higher scales in physics if they exist. And in particular for gravity, uh, we have the Planck scale, so we have an explicit scale um, way above uh, the electroweak scale. And there are several approaches to, to solve this. Supersymmetry is uh, the most famous and most studied one. Um, composite Higgs models are another one. And let me show you one thing which is, I think, um, kind of the origin of uh, composite Higgs models. And this is the question, um, what happens in the standard model if there is no Higgs? Do we still have electroweak symmetry breaking? And the answer is yes. So I take the standard model Lagrangian, I take the Higgs sector away, now I have my gauge group, I just take the first family of quarks, and now um, in, this, uh, in this quark sector I have a global uh, symmetry, the UR and DR basically are undistinguishable from the, uh, from the point of view of uh, QCD. So you have an SU2L cross SU2R symmetry in QCD. But what now happens when QCD gets strong is that the quarks form bound states. Uh, so they condensate. And the condensate of uh, two quarks will break this symmetry. And uh, this will break, uh, break the symmetry down to the diagonal subgroup SU2. And from a breaking of three plus three degrees of freedom down to three, we know that we get three Goldstone bosons. And those three Goldstone bosons are not, nothing but the pions. And um, so through the condensation uh, of quarks, you get a condensate, and the scale for this condensate is of the order of 200 uh, or the scale set by this is of the order of 200 uh, MeV. And those pions are charged under uh, SU, uh, SU2. So um, they actually give mass to the W and the Z bosons. And this mechanism uh, does not suffer from the hierarchy problem because we didn't put any mass scale in here. This scale is generated because QCD runs logarithmically very slowly, but it becomes strongly coupled uh, at a scale um, which is of the order uh, of the scale or actually a little bit higher. So the standard model would have a natural solution for uh, electroweak symmetry breaking, but if we look a bit closer at the predictions of this, uh, it tells us that the W mass and the Z mass are equal and they are 100 MeV. MeV, not GeV, i.e. it's three orders of magnitude too small. Um, there is no Higgs degree of freedom. Uh, so the Higgs particle which has been found at LHC uh, wouldn't be there. Also the electromagnetic uh, charge would be equal to the U1Y charge 
and we don't have any masses for quarks and leptons. So this model is a complete failure, as an experimentalist would tell you. And a, phenomenolo a phenomenologist would be quite shocked as well. But uh, if you're a model builder, you start thinking about using this kind of mechanism and dressing it up into something which could give you uh, a natural explanation for the, um, for the Higgs or for the electroweak scale at uh, 100 GeV. And if you're a formal theorist, you're probably happy by now because chiral symmetry breaking is solving the problem and you can uh, get to more complicated things. So um, this was just a warm up. Now, uh, coming to the minimal composite Higgs model, uh, this is a, or I should say, along those lines of uh, strongly coupled group, which is condensating, there has been a lot of work basically since the early 80s. Um, Technicolor models fall into this uh, category. Uh, later on, uh, little Higgs models, many variations of this. And the composite Higgs models I'll be, I'll be talking about fall into the same class. Um, minimal composite Higgs models, um, it's the same idea, but a slightly different approach. Uh, here, the question which is asked is, how can I build a model such that I get the right ingredients, i.e. such that I get a Higgs boson with the right uh, properties. So uh, in those models, you say, I want to take a global symmetry group, uh, like we had in QCD, SU2 cross SU2. And uh, this group uh, will be spontaneously broken by some confinement. And then uh, we want to have the standard model electroweak gauge group as uh, some part of it, and then some, uh, some un, un, uh, unbroken gauge group, which is basically our, uh, our photon. And the question is, what is the minimal assignment uh, for those uh, group, group assignments such that you can get a Higgs with the right quantum numbers? And the answer which has been found by uh, those gentlemen and by the way, you can find a very nice uh, overview over the minimal composite Higgs model in those uh, lecture notes by Contino. Um, found the following answer. So you take SO5 and an additional U1. And then uh, what you do is you take as a, as a group SO4. So you have here a breaking of SO5 down to SO4. And this breaking gives you four Goldstone bosons. And uh, this is basically isomorphic to an SU2L cross SU2R, um, which is basically the standard model group. Here you have the standard model group for the SU2L, and the U1Y in the standard model is the diagonal subgroup in this SU2R. And there's also a very uh, useful uh, addition if you embed it in this group, which is basically that you have an additional symmetry which protects you from some corrections. This is custodial symmetry. Um, and then what do we need the additional U1X for? If I would just use the SO5 to SO4 breaking, uh, the electroweak sector would actually work fine, but I need to assign the correct charges also to the um, uptype quark and the downtype quarks, and I need to assign different charges there. So for that, I need to put in an additional uh, U1 and then get the hypercharge as a combination of the third direction of this uh, SU to R charge and my X charge. So that's the, uh, the minimal setup to get a Higgs with the right quantum numbers. Now, how is this uh, solving the uh, jobs of the Higgs? And here, uh, it's getting a bit technical, but I'll just give you the main, uh, the main points. So we have uh, the Higgs now uh, realized at go as Goldstone bosons, so we can parameterize them as, um, as uh, linear sigma fields and basically do chiral uh, perturbation theory here. And uh, so you just deal with it like you normally deal with Goldstone bosons. You write down the kinetic term uh, for those Goldstone bosons, and now if you expand out this term, I mean here, the Higgs is basically sitting uh, sitting in here, so this is a nonlinear uh, realization. And if I expand out this term, then here I get something which, at leading order, 
gives me one times uh, the W mass uh, times the W and here the Z mass and the Z. So it gives me a mass term for the, for the W, but it also gives me higher order interactions of the Higgs with Ws and Zs um, in this expansion. And here I did one identification, which is uh, this, uh, this Xi parameter, is the vacuum expectation value over the decay constant uh, squared of this, so to speak, pion. So you have an expansion parameter in here, which is uh, the electroweak vacuum expectation value over my decay constant F in those models. And uh, we will see later that this value has to be smallish of the order of, uh, so the square, square have to be of the order of 0.1 from experimental measurements. Uh, but the upshot here is, first of all, we generate uh, masses for the gauge bosons, and we get corrections to the couplings of the gauge bosons uh, to the Higgs. We get higher order corrections. And we can systematically expand this uh, as long as V over F is a, uh, is a perturbative parameter. And the second part, uh, how do you generate <coughs> masses for, uh, for fermions? Now, the Higgs is an object which transforms nonlinearly, so we can't write down a Yukawa term with a Higgs field and, a, uh, and two fermions anymore, because the elementary fermions transform linearly, the Higgs transforms nonlinearly, so the overall ob object is not, uh, not invariant anymore. But what you can do is, um, you can mix the elementary quark with some uh, other heavy fermion which transforms nonlinearly. In this case, if you have the Goldstone boson matrix, you can have a coupling of uh, the elementary quark transforming linearly, uh, this uh, composite quark transforming nonlinearly in precisely the way that this is giving you an invariant uh, with, a, with a Goldstone boson matrix. So in order to generate masses uh, for the quarks, one way to do this is to have a mixing of elementary quarks with heavy quarks, and then this would be the way you get a coupling of the light quarks uh, or the, the standard model quarks with the Higgs. You do it through those mixing terms. And in a technical way, um, here, if you want to write this out, you can do it in a Spurion analysis where you embed the elementary quarks in representations of your global symmetry group, and you also have your partner in some representation of the symmetry group. But you have, you have choices, uh, so it depends on which representation you pick, on what precise outcome you get for, uh, for those mass terms and those corrections. And the final, uh, final point, uh, if you have a Higgs, and it is a Goldstone boson. If it's really a Goldstone boson, it doesn't have a potential because uh, you have a shift symmetry and this is pre uh, preventing any non-derivative interactions, i.e. any potential terms. So one question is in those models, how do you get a, get a Higgs potential? Um, and this I'm just going to mention here, uh, you have some interactions which explicitly break your global symmetry. One part is that uh, you have your global symmetry SO5, but only the electroweak standard model group is a local symmetry group, which is a subgroup in there. So this gauging of the electroweak group is breaking the global, global symmetry uh, group explicitly. And also, when you write down those mixings, here you see the standard model quark embedded in a representation, but we actually only fill one element. So this is just a bookkeeping trick. Uh, to write it apparently as, uh, as O5 invariant, but by demanding that those entries are zero, we break the symmetry explicitly. So um, if you calculate the effective potential, then you get loops of gauge bosons or of top or top partners, which give you contributions to the, uh, to the Higgs potential, um, which in the minimal composite Higgs model take such a form. And now if you want to have, uh, want, want to look at the minimum, then the minimum sits at, uh, in units of V at one minus the ratio 
uh, or sorry, in units of xi at one uh, minus the ratio of those co coefficients. And these coefficients depend on the precise model. Are you saying that the full symmetry does not have SO5 symmetry? The full symmetry does not have exact SO5 symmetry. Um, the point is that you have, um, if you take the couplings which break the SO5 symmetry to zero, you have an exact Goldstone boson. And now the only sources which break the SO5 are uh, electroweak couplings, which are small, so I can expand in them, and uh, couplings in the, um, in the fermion sector. It's an approximate symmetry. It's an approximate symmetry in the same way uh, the SU, uh, SU2L cross SU2R in the QCD is uh, approximate because the quark masses break it and as a consequence, pions don't have zero mass, but I have a natural explanation why the pion masses are uh, only a few hundred MeV and they are not pulled to the, uh, to the Planck scale. Sorry? Yes. Um, the left and right degrees with respect to. Yes. 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 Uh, under the global symmetry, no. Um, and so the embedding is in such a way that, so the, SU, uh, the, the left SU2, you gauge. And in the right SU2, you gauge part of the diagonal subgroup. So, um, but, so the, uh, the idea is that you have explicit breaking, but this explicit breaking is under control in that if you take it to zero, you restore the exact, uh, exact symmetry. Um, so here, this is just to, to illustrate, you, you generate a potential for the Higgs. Now, if you want to have this, uh, need to have the scale of the order of a TeV, then uh, naturally the minimum is at the scale F. If you want to get it uh, quite a bit lower, you need to have this ratio almost precisely cancelling such that you uh, can get a XI value which is smaller. So here, um, this cancellation is a small uh, hierarchy problem you have in the uh, composite Higgs models. And typically, the bound you have on XI is of the order of 0.1. Uh, so you need some, uh, some cancellation between uh, the corrections you get from the electroweak part and the corrections you get from the top loop parts, basically. So uh, to just summarize uh, some points here, and I should also speed up a bit, I think, um, you get, in the minimal composite Higgs model, you get modifications of the couplings of the Higgs to gauge bosons, and we measure those at the LHC. Uh, you get uh, corrections to the uh, couplings of the Higgs to fermions, and those corrections depend on which re representation you put the fermions in, so there, there are different choices. Um, also, if you want to obtain uh, the correct top mass, because the Yukawa of the top is of, of order one, and you can estimate the size of uh, the Yukawa from this construction, and for that, you want to have the mass of the top partners not too much heavier than the scale F. So the, the top partners should not be too heavy. Um, and finally, you need partial cancellation uh, between gauge and top loop contributions in order to get the vacuum expectation value well below the scale F. Um, so that's the summary of the model. Now, how can you look for this? Here is a plot by the, um, by the HEPFIT collaboration. And they basically did a fit to uh, couplings of the Higgs to top and the 
Higgs to V in a simplified, uh, simplified fit, uh, or in a different plane, uh, couplings to gauge bosons and the B, or to the tau and uh, gauge bosons. The ellipsis you see is one, two, and three uh, sig sigma allowed deviations. And those dotted lines you see is the minimal comp composite Higgs model, where you have two different lines for two different fermion uh, uh, representation or fermions embeddings. So the upshot you get from this is that if this ratio V over F is of the order 0.1, then in both models you, you are within one or two sigma agreement everywhere. Uh, if you go to larger xi, then you start to get excluded. So this is uh, an exclusion on or a bound on this scale F basically coming from uh, deviations of Higgs measurements. You have analogous uh, measurements from uh, electric precision data. Um, but they all point the scale F to the order of a TEV. Does this have bounds from the mechanical? The mechanical? You are modifying the coupling of the Higgs to the gauge bosons. Um, you, in principle, have. So it's a difficult question because your symmetry is realized non linearly. So if you ca calculate naive bounds from your materiality, um, then you might see an arti artificial bound you reach, which is just because you didn't take the expansions uh, of the higher orders into account. But uh, yes, you get unitary, uh, unitarity bounds, meaning uh, at a certain point when your expansion parameter is no good anymore, uh, those, uh, those bounds get out of control. So you, you get bounds there as well. And in this treatment of the so normally those things are treated in terms of effective field theory models. So you truncate your, your operator expansion at a certain order. And then at some point uh, you violate unitarity. If you would go to higher order, this bound might change a bit because in the end, the nonlinearity of the interaction should take care of this. But then it's a problem that your pert uh, pert uh, pertub uh, perturbation theory is not working anymore. And you can also look for your additional particles, which is the, um, in this case, the top partners. And there are active search programs by Atlas and CMS for uh, new vector-like fermions, i.e. those top partners. And uh, Atlas and CMS are looking for pair production of the top, or this partner comes in SU2 multiplets. So the experiments also looks, uh, look for fermions with charge 5 third, 2 third, minus 1 third, and minus 4 third. And uh, the bounds they find on those masses, uh, on those particles is a mass of above 1.3 TeV for the exotically charged 5 third particle. And, whoops, sorry, for the, um, for the 2 third and minus 1 third, you see those triangles, which basically <coughs> means this particle can decay in various decay channels, one is WB, one is Higgs top, and there is, is, is a third one, Z top, which is uh, basically here it's assumed that the sum of the three branching ratios is one, so it's not displayed in this plane, but the, the full information is contained here. And the current experimental bounds lie uh, everywhere in this plane at the order of 1.3 or even a little bit higher. So that's another way of looking for indirect signs of those composite Higgs models. This was the minimal model, and now I will change gears a bit uh, because of time. Now, uh, this was looking at the minimal model and, and uh, at an kind of effective construction just coming from global symmetries. The original idea was to take an underlying gauge group which confines uh, and you have some, uh, some meta content, some new meta content, which gives you bound states as the Higgs. So the picture is that you have a scale like the QCD scale, just scaled up to a few TeV. You realize the whole Higgs multiplet as a bound state uh, multiplet at the electroweak scale. And you want to have the decay constant of this multiplet due to experimental constraints by now of the order of 800 GeV or a TeV. But if you have a strongly coupled model here, you will not only get uh, your 
um, your Higgs as bound state, but you will also get many other resonances at the scale of the strong coupling here. Like in QCD, you have baryonic resonances, you have vector resonances, you have scalar resonances. So you expect new particles at this scale. And in addition, in this construction, um, we want to really say what is the confining gauge group and what is the particle content. And it's not clear that you can get the minimal model out of this construction. Um, there has been work started, or for a long while people have been working in terms of global symmetries. And this has been revived by Tony Gergetta in 2014. And uh, a few months later, Gabriele Ferretti did a classification uh, for a wish list uh, for those models and constructed models which can do this. And here's the wish list, so we, they won't uh, they want no elementary scalars because they could reintroduce the hierarchy problem. They want a simple uh, gauge group confining. You want to have a Higgs candidate with the right quantum numbers, and you want to have a top partner which can mix with the top such that you can generate mass terms for the top. Uh, you also want asymptotic freedom, no gauge anomalies, so several consistency conditions. And now uh, those models were classified uh, mostly by Gabriele, and all those models contain several top partner multiplets, and all of those models contain additional light states beyond the Higgs multiplet. And this is what I want to use in the second part for experiments. I'll give you very briefly one example model, which is basically the model which has been proposed by Tony Gergetta. Uh, so what is done here is you take a gauge group, in this case sp2 and c, and you take four fermions of one type uh, under this gauge group, and this gives you an SU4 symmetry. And now if those fermions condense, uh, this, the condensate breaks the SU4 down to SP4. And in that set, you, uh, you want to embed your Higgs. Now you also want to have top partners, and for this you need another group of fermions such that uh, a bound state of two of those fermions with one of this fermion can give you a state which has color charge and electroweak charge. So here you see the field content uh, of the underlying model, and here you see the bound states where you have uh, your Goldstone bosons. Uh, here the electroweak ones, and here the colored ones. You have the bound states, uh, or the fermionic bound states, and you also have heavier uh, vector and scalar bound states. And in here, this particle uh, contains the Higgs doublet and one additional particle. So miss, mission accomplished on the Higgs part. And here, several of those particles have the right quantum numbers to mix with the top partner. There is a whole list of those models. Uh, I won't go through it, but they are categorized. Um, and I labeled them through here, M1 to M12. And this is what uh, we call minimal composite Higgs models. Um, but all those groups are larger than the SO5 mod SO4 model. But from the underlying construction, uh, those are the smallest groups you get. And here you have uh, the additional states. Uh, so in all of the models, you have two standard model neutral states, and one linear combination of them is an uh, actual Goldstone boson. The other linear combination uh, picks up a mass from a global anomaly very much to the eta, uh, similar to the eta prime in QCD. And this you have in all models. Also in all models, you have a colored uh, octet uh, pseudonumbo Goldstone boson. Depending on the model, you have different sets of electroweak uh, gauge bosons, uh, pseudonumbo Goldstone bosons. And also you have, in addition to the octet, you can have uh, other colored pseudo Goldstone bosons. So this just comes out of the classification of those models. And now uh, I am going to show you two quick examples of what you can do in terms of phenomenology with those underlying models. Uh, and what's the difference of doing the phenomenology from those models as compared to doing it in an uh, EFT way. The first example is this. Uh, set of two Goldstone bosons, which are standard model singlets. Uh, they come from the global U1 symmetries you have on the two different fermion species. And as I said, one linear combination has a, a global anomaly with respect to the 
condensing group. So one linear combination is made heavy, but the orthogonal linear combination stays light. And, uh, but we know the underlying field content of uh, both of those linear combinations. So I can write down now an effective Lagrangian describing this model, which has a kinetic term, a mass term, then couplings to gauge bosons, which are uh, westomino witten uh, terms, couplings to fermions, and you can also calculate uh, or write down higher order interactions of this field uh, to the Higgs or to the, to the gauge bosons. But the nice thing is now that there are only very few parameters. The mass of this particle uh, does not come out of the model itself, so this we have to get by ex uh, explicit external breaking of those two U1s. And here you have the overall decay constant uh, of this model. And this is basically, the scale is related to where your, uh, your uh, theory becomes strongly coupled. Um, but this is something you also choose as an input from, the, uh, from, from outside, i.e. what you use as a starting value for your, uh, for your strong gauge theory. But all the other parameters, in, in particular those anomaly parameters, and also the couplings to the fermions, uh, are fixed and calculable from the model. In the very same way, um, the decay constant of pions into photons are uh, calculable in QCD. So if we take one model, then the ra uh, those parameters, and therefore all the ratios of those parameters, are fixed. And for the phenomenology, we expect A to be light, eta to be heavy. How heavy depends on how large the mass is. Uh, it picks up from the anomaly. They are pro produced via this interaction in gluon fusion. Um, the resonances are narrow. If I put a scale of the order of 1 TeV for this scale F, I find that the, uh, that the uh, resonances are all narrow. And I know for a given model all the ratios of uh, branching ratios of the particles. So what I can do is I can collect all the different searches from Atlas and CMS at 7, 8, and 13 <coughs> TeV in diboson channels uh, or in two fermion channels. Um, and I can translate all the combined bounds from this as a bound on the scale uh, F psi, which is related to my composite Higgs scale. And we present this here in a plane of the mass of the real Goldstone boson, Ma, versus the mass of the eta prime, which is the state we expect to be heavy. Uh, one reason is that this particle picks up a mass from an anomaly term, but we do not know the precise value of this, uh, of this anomaly mass. Uh, this is something which, in the end, probably can only be determined on the lattice. But for any combination of those masses, you can determine a bound. This lower region is not accessible because uh, when you put in the mixing angle, you can't uh, get such mass ratios. And in the upper part, you see for this model, this is one example, model five, um, in most of the plane, in particular for, uh, for relatively heavy eta and uh, for light A, uh, you get bounds which are way below one TeV, meaning that the, uh, that the LHC direct searches are not excluding uh, this part of the parameter space. And even elsewhere, the bounds are relatively weak. This is a combination of uh, all the searches uh, status last December. Now, we also, we studied uh, several channels uh, or several possibilities to close this gap at lower masses and also there have been many projections for uh, the uh, high luminosity LHC at uh, three inverse uh, autobahn and uh, 300 uh, inverse femtobahn by the experimental collaborations for various channels in the last yellow report. So here you see the projected sensitivity um, for three inverse autobahn. Uh, this is especially relevant for the, uh, for the bounds at higher masses of eta prime and of A. And down here in the lower, uh, lower corner, you see that you can cover this parameter space and you, you can push the bounds uh, for this particular model up to uh, two to three TeV, 
if you don't find anything new, and if those searches are really performed. But those searches currently are not being done. Uh, for time reasons, I won't go into the details, but I will talk about this more uh, tomorrow morning at uh, 11. So from this, the main upshot, um, you get light composite uh, pseudonumber goldstones in all of those models, and in particular, if uh, in a mass window between about 15 and 70 GeV, which is very light, those particles are not excluded and not well tested by current searches. So it's not true that there is no chance of seeing anything at LHC in terms of uh, lighter particles anymore. And this is even something which is produced in gluon fusion. So this was uh, new searches or uh, the situation for one example of those pseudonumber goldstone bosons. Now, the second point uh, which I wanted to quickly make is I showed you this, uh, those bounds for uh, the decay of vector-like quarks into standard model channels, and here we had solid bounds of the order of 1.3 TeV everywhere. But now, let's look at the situation in those underlying models. We saw that we have additional uh, pseudo-goldstone bosons. They should be lighter than the top partners. So kinematically, the top partners can uh, decay not only into WZ bosons and Higgses, but also into those light goldstones. And from the construction point of view, the Higgs and the longitudinal degrees of the W and Z boson are precisely the same. They are pseudonumber goldstone bosons of the composite sector. So you wouldn't expect uh, the decays into electroweak gauge bosons to dominate. And with underlying models, you can uh, basically calculate the branching ratio into, uh, gauge, uh, into the standard model gauge bosons or into those new sets of particles. And we were uh, not completely mapping out, but we were looking into a few examples uh, for models to see whether you can get substantial branching ratios into other uh, pseudo-goldstone bosons. And it turns out you can. And we looked at several uh, scenarios here. I will just look at one, which is uh, the decay of a top partner into precisely this singlet pseudo uh, goldstone uh, boson A, where I showed you that uh, it can be very light. So uh, this decay you can have. Um, I won't say much here. This is just uh, the Lagrangian of the top partner, and everything here is what ATLAS and CMS is doing all the time, apart from this last term. So here you have the couplings of the top partner to uh, the third generation quarks and the electroweak gauge bosons, or the Higgs. And here you have an analogous term uh, with a coupling to this new Goldstone boson. You can do the same for the charge minus one third particle. And then this state A, this is the same Lagrangian as beforehand which determines the decays there. So if you uh, look into an underlying model, you can, for a benchmark point, calculate uh, or adjust masses for the top and the bottom partner and can calculate those, uh, those coefficients which basically determine the uh, mixing or the coupling of the top partners to tops and goldstone bosons or this. And here you see the branching ratio of um, the top partner into different final states versus the mass of the A. And you can see that in this particular point, you get branching ratios to TA, which are comparable to those uh, to TH. This is just one point, uh, but we didn't need to search for too long. So we didn't need to tune a lot in order to get comparable branching ratios. So phenomenology, uh, you can produce the top partners in pair production like always, but now one of those top partners or both could decay also into this new pseudo-scalar. You can also have single production of the top partner and then a decay into those, this new pseudo-scalar. And for the pseudo-scalar, I plotted you the branching ratios as a function of mass here into the different channels uh, for one example model. Uh, but what is quite generic is that the dominant decay, as long as you you are below twice the top mass, 
The dominant decay channel is either uh, BB bar or the decay into two gluons. And then uh, tau tau typically is the next branching ratio and the rest is relatively highly suppressed. So the most common ones are BB bar or glue glue. So if I now look at bounds I get from uh, the pair production of those top partners, and if I assume that both top partners decay into top A, top A, and A decays either into glue glue or BB, my experimental situation completely changes because my final state is different. And now I have, in particular, if I, if I have a top, top bar and four jets here, I have a final state which is relatively hard to, uh, to trace down. And we looked at uh, a larger number of experimental searches, tried to track down those which have the best potential to give us bounds on the model. And what you see here is the result from recasting those various searches uh, where you have the mass of the top partner versus the mass of the uh, pseudoscalar. Um, what is red is forbidden uh, by this type of search, RPV SUSY. What is gray is forbidden by excited top searches. What is blue is forbidden by VLQ searches. And you see that if you have the dominant decay into glue glue, there are regions even as low as 500 GeV which are still not excluded. If you have the dominant decays into BB bar, um, your bounds are stronger, but you still can go down to about a TeV for light MA masses. This is just uh, one particular point where we assume branching ratio 100% into uh, top A. In the paper, we also have the combination with, uh, with other channels. But the main message here is you naturally have those new pseudoscalars. They naturally open new decay channels. And those new decay channels change the bounds you have from existing searches. And they also offer you new search possibilities. So uh, those things can change uh, your phenomenology a lot. And for quite a few of those channels, there are no direct uh, active searches at the LHC currently. Um, and it's a very good time to study those searches right now because currently LHC is not taking data and the collaborations are in the process of uh, preparing for the next run. But they won't go to higher energy in the next run. So with every existing search, you will only increase by square root of n, which is uh, where n is the amount of data you take. So you very slowly increase the bounds, and roughly speaking, where you don't have an excess already, it's unlikely that you will see something. Or you have a breakthrough in, uh, in your analysis uh, techniques. But for new channels, um, basically, if you do a new search, you can find uh, can find something easily because the current uh, the space is currently not uh, not covered yet. So with this, let me come to the conclusions. Um, composite Higgs models can give you a solution to the hierarchy problem. Um, there are many challenges. Those are strongly coupled models, and many things are difficult to calculate. I was talking here mostly about the uh, about the pseudo Goldstone boson sector because this is one thing where you have some perturbative control to do calculations. Um, effective field theory descriptions of composite Higgs models and the minimal composite Higgs models are very useful uh, to parameterize the model and to do generic studies uh, on bounds you have on the models. If you have specific UEV embeddings, this is giving you relations between many different parameters in your uh, EFT description. So in that sense, uh, those models are more predictive. They point you to uh, particular uh, areas, and they motivate particular signatures, which you might miss if you only do an EFT. In the end, we just determine the, uh, the, uh, the particle content. And in the end, we do an EFT for the models. But we do this guided by uh, underlying models. In those models, you always have additional states which can be light, and uh, current searches do not exclude those states, and they can motivate new searches if you look for directly producing them. 
And uh, those states can also occur in the decay of top partners, which can also give you new phenomenology there. And finally, I should say, I have been talking a lot about those models with underlying uh, gauge group, and I have been focusing mostly about particle physics. There are many, many more topics, um, and there are many things to do. So as a last point, let me just put up some questions on composite Higgs models, where I now focused on a little bit the UV model or one type of UV model buildings and the implications for particle physics. But there are many other uh, topics also for cosmology or dark matter, some of which uh, several people in the audience have much more experience and much more to say about than I do. So let me stop here and thank you for your attention. So questions for Thomas? Okay, uh, I don't know. So can you comment about uh, the main differences between those composite Higgs models and the old Technicolor model? Um, so in the first generation of Technicolor models, uh, you, didn't, you didn't realize the whole Higgs multiplet as a Goldstone boson multiplet. You just took the three degrees of freedom which you need in order to provide the gauge boson. So this is out directly. One point here, uh, which is also different, is that so you take the whole Higgs multiplet and you need to generate a hierarchy between, uh, or you, you need to get in the potential a hierarchy, uh, hierarchy between the vacuum expectation value and the scale f. In a sense, um, it is two limits of the same theory. Because in the end, what's, what you're doing is you single out one particular direction through chiral symmetry breaking, and you have one direction singled out through the, uh, through the Higgs wave. If those are completely orthogonal, you have a technicolor model. If they are, uh, if they, they are identical, you don't generate a mass uh, or a potential for the Higgs. So what you, in the end, need for those models to work is that you have a slight misalignment uh, of the direction of Higgs breaking to, uh, to those models. So in that sense, it's, um, I would say it's a subclass of Technicolor models, but this is always difficult uh, or risky to say, because then people say that somebody else said that Technicolor is dead, and it isn't. Those models are not suffering from uh, a large t-parameter. This is built in by, by symmetry. They are not suffering from a large s-parameter, which was the main killer for Technicolor. Um, and, okay, the next difficult question in Technicolor is building in the whole flavor sector. And this, I should say, in those models is also a complication. So how to really generate the CKM matrix and get the things uh, is needs more model building. When will we have experiments that test the self-coupling of Higgs? Or will we? So, um, if a uh, any plus and minus machine is built, which is going uh, going above the uh, twice the Higgs mass, uh, you will be able to to measure this. Um, we are all very much hoping that such a machine will be built. Currently, it's not confirmed yet, but uh, ILC, if I uh, I don't remember the precise uh, precise numbers, but if you go uh, if you go to that scale in any plus and minus machine, uh, you have a chance measuring it. If you go to higher energies for a uh, proton collider, I, I would have to check. Sorry, this is something I should have present, but I don't. No, you know, this is um, to measure this. You need that to produce two Higgses in the final state. So that's how you measure triple Higgs uh, coupling, for instance. And it, I think, okay, maybe pessimistic, but I think we're, you can never underestimate the uh, ingenuity of experimentalists. Maybe Ricardo has some uh, observations. Yeah, I think it's going to be able to do double conversion in the 
Yeah, I, I, I have in my mind, but these I cannot point to a specific reference, but something around 10% precision on, on the three linear Higgs coupling by doing double Higgs pr production at high luminosity LHC. And that is happening, right? That is approved already. So I think All they the might get to a 10% precision in there. For the standard model yeah. dihex. Yeah, okay. for the standard model. Yeah, three linear. Now there's also quadrilinear. Then uh, mm -hmm. you need triple Higgs production, and it's a bit more. That's one one interesting point about the dihex is that measuring the standard model value is very difficult because you have one contribution from the triple Higgs, but uh, you have a second contribution uh, to. Uh, to die Higgs via, uh, via top quark loops. the top quark loops. And those two contributions <laughs> negatively interfere. So in the standard model, the value is lower than you might expect. So even if you don't have a die Higgs uh, direct measurement yet, it can be a very, full, a very powerful test for BSM models because once you start twinkling with the top or the Higgs sector, uh, you can disturb this interference. So uh, in BSM models, often the prediction for dihex is much larger than for the standard model. So it's useful even now to set bounds on some models. Yeah. So I have another question. Um, you mentioned some light states that uh, have not been, you know, there are no bounds on this light state. Yes. So why is that? What, what finer state you're looking for? I mean, if you're looking for so uh, one state I mean here concretely is what? Because if they, they came to photons, for instance, I'm sure there will be uh, bounds, no? So, <laughs> okay, let's let's go into uh, first this picture. So I mean, this guy, standard model singlet, yeah. produced by a gluon fusion, yeah. decays into diphotons. Yes. Uh, yeah. The branching ratio into diphotons is relatively small. Okay. And there are no bounds for a resonance decaying into diphotons uh, below 65 GeV mass. Just because of the background? Because of the background, and there, there is no way of doing this directly, uh, especially at the uh, high luminosity LHC, because the backgrounds get larger and larger. Um, this area, normally you would say, yeah, but this is so ruled out by lab. But it's not ruled out by lab because this is produced in gluon fusion. Exactly. So this is a gap which is left, and you have as the main decay channels glue glue and BB bar. Oh, that's the swamp, swamp by background. So actually, um, here, uh, there is one paper where we suggested to use uh, die taus. And there is one uh, proposal by Mariotti at the same time you, uh, using die photons. But you have to overcome the triggers. So you actually don't measure the die photon, but you you boost uh, the signal against initial, uh, initial state radiation in order to get beyond the triggers. And then you can try to do a dedicated search for a hard jet. And for the die photons, uh, they uh, basically found a way to reinterpret uh, die photon searches. We were doing a very naive thing and were suggesting to look looking for opposite sign, opposite flavor leptons, i.e. taking two leptonic decays of the taus boosting it, but then you need to overcome at least one lepton trigger. And those, for this particular model, this green line is the projection from Mariotti. This black line is the projection, uh, or the, the, the uh, projected sensitivity for the diet house. But I should say, which one is better depends a lot on which model you look at, which basically comes to the question whether the photon over tau uh, branching ratio is large or small in that given model. So there are proposals to fill this gap, but uh, we are currently in contact with uh, LHCB. Um, and uh, this group uh, is, I'm sure, in contact with, uh, uh, with the experiments as well in order to, to push for this search. If this search is done, 
you get coverage, but you still, you know, you go up to right. uh, one, two, maybe two and a half TeV, which is good, which is, which is testing the relevant parameter region. Okay, so just a reminder that uh, Thomas is giving a, a more technical talk uh, tomorrow at 11, and uh, we have refreshments uh, for the uh, audience after the talk, so let's thank uh, Thomas again. Branching, right? It's just a matter of luminosity, then, right? No, 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 no. The the problem is.